So today, in front of you, I want you to put the Quran to the test using the scientific method. Hmm. Hi guys. A man with a beard and a dress sits at a table and wants to educate us, us people of the 21st century. Isn't that cute? Now he calls himself a sheikh, a learned man, and that's what I would expect now, a sound explanation of the link between an old book and science. The video he appears in is Quran and Science, an interesting story, and his name is Sheikh Farouk. Now, unfortunately, my expectations, my high expectations, if this is a sheikh, are shattered just after sort of 11 seconds into the video because a banner comes up saying amazing scientific miracles in the Quran. But the spelling is a transliteration of Arabic as in Quran. <laughs> now, science can be either scientific or scientific. And a miracle is neither. A miracle is something outside the laws of physics, and since science was designed by human beings to explain natural phenomena, a miracle, well, it's outside of that. Now, if a miracle, or anything supernatural for that matter, if it were to be detected or would be detected by science, well, then it would immediately be seen as natural as otherwise it could not be detected by science, could it? It's quite easy. So our Muslim apologist from the US makes really fundamental errors right from the start, the somehow reducing my expectation to zero right now. He says we should examine the Quran using the scientific method. You can't do that. You might as well be using windscreen wipers or a bicycle pump or whatever. The scientific method is used to develop an idea into knowledge, not to check on you know, an old book with flying donkeys and talking ants. Now, what he does is absurd. It's total and utter nonsense. Because he says he will put up the hypothesis that the Quran is a divine source. But based on what observation, what does it explain using what tests? What he's doing in reality is just making a claim, a claim based on unsubstantiated claims in themselves. Because in order for the book to have a divine origin, this divine entity must first be established and demonstrated. Okay, so let's see what he has to offer and I'll just do a quick rundown, all right? Using the scientific method, you have to have a hypothesis. My hypothesis that I'm going to put in front of you today is the Quran is of divine source. It could not it possibly have been written by a, name, by a man named Muhammad or anybody around him in the time period where it was revealed to him. Well, actually, he's right. I, I don't think so either. I, I think this was um, written a lot later in a totally different place. And this, this story with Muhammad is just something to make it palatable for the people at the time. So in, in this aspect, yeah, I agree with him. At that time in the Arabian desert, a man who was illiterate, and even if he could read, he didn't have the libraries of the Greeks or the Romans or, or any of that kind of research in front of him to be able to read. Nobody around him could have known the scientific facts that are mentioned in the Quran. This is my hypothesis. Let's put it to the test today in front of us. If we can test this theory against available... Now, hang on. He first calls it a hypothesis. Now he says it's a theory. So it has somehow advanced, but it's still the same claim. What he's saying is, well, there's something in the Quran and this is a scientific fact. Well, it's not. So you first need to demonstrate it. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Available facts, available information that we have scientifically today. And if we can prove it that repeatedly it would come true, then we have to agree that this is a fact that this book is of divine origins. No, 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 no. It doesn't work like that. If, if you have a book and it agrees with reality, then all you've done is you've shown it agrees with reality. You, you cannot make the jump from it agrees with reality and therefore it's a di of divine origins because then a lot of books would be... No, come on China, you can't do that. 
you, you need to be honest and you need to be you know just down to earth and you need to admit that all you're doing is you're grasping at straws you're incredibly desperate and all you're doing is if something were to be correct in the quran then this is just showing that something is correct okay it's brilliant if there's a book out there that actually does give you anything that is scientifically accurate and correct that is only known nowadays then this would be remarkable and you would have my attention but this is by no ways sufficient to say well then a god must have done it no sorry it just doesn't work so we look at scientific research in astronomy what is the origin of the universe the galaxy the planets today the accepted theory today is called the nebular hypothesis um i don't know what that is i have no idea what he's talking about and according to this the sun and the planets in our solar system began as a giant cloud of smoke uh, no they did not I think yeah this is the typical thing. <laughs> he finds the word smoke in the Quran and now frantically looks on the internet for something similar but there is no such thing there's no such, smoke is a byproduct of combustion and it contains particles gas does not so he, he's trying to make gas into smoke and then says well because they are so similar therefore this is correct no it is not and then it came together and that's not what the Quran says either the, the Quran speaks about I don't know this is this it, it just repeats what the old Sumerian said I mean you can read this in the uh, Gilgamesh uh, the epic of Gilgamesh and there it says how earth and the sky or the heaven or whatever they were separated so the Quran is just repeating the, the old stuff from the Zoroastrians from the Indians from the Sumerians from anything that you know all the myths and and legends and stories that were around this era and this uh, this this region there's nothing nothing special here as bodies for example planets and solar systems and galaxies and I'm sorry the solar system was not around at the beginning of the universe so what what he is saying is that if the universe was I don't know constructed or came into being or whatever you want to call it then this was 10,000 million years before that so what he is doing he is introducing a 10,000 million year era into the Quran this theory was proposed by Emanuel Swedenborg and then Immanuel Kant in 1755 he published this what 1100 years 1100 years before them the Quran is stated what is the Quran and I'm going to give you the chapter and verse numbers so you can look it up yourself in the 41st <laughs> chapter in the 11th verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he directed himself towards the, the heavens and there were smoke so how could a man in a desert who was illiterate and had no literature, no scientific evidence, no scientific works around him, no scientists around him, no scientific research going on in a desert, have known that. Well, number one, he didn't because allegedly, according to the standard narrative, it was given to him by a god. So this is nothing to do with Muhammad. And the second thing is, um, the, the, con the Quran contradicts itself because, you know, in, in the one sentence it says, well, he first created the earth and then he first created the heavens. So, you know, it's, it's just picking and choosing. 1100 years before people like Immanuel Kant with all their scientific research and books and libraries working on the works of other scientists came up with this. You may say, okay, he guessed. It was a lucky guess. Okay, let's put that to the test. The sun and the moon, they move in an orbit. How do we know that? Um, no, they don't. What, what the Quran is saying is that we have Earth and the moon and sun move in an orbit around Earth because it also mentions that the moon can catch up to the sun. So there, there are certain things which um, imply a, this, this, this is quite funny, not a helio, but, but a, a geocentric Earth, a geocentric model where the Earth is in the middle and everything else rotates orbits or whatever Earth. Galileo in 1632, he used his invention, the telescope, to look and prove that the Sun and the Moon, they have an orbit and they move in that orbit. 
No, he did not. But over a thousand years before Galileo, with no telescope and no ability to have any scientific work in front of him, how could a man named Muhammad, peace be upon him, in a desert have known that? But in the Quran, in the 21st chapter, 33rd verse, it says, Who is the one who the night and the sun and the sun and the sun? كل في فلك يسبحون. What does Allah? Why should we clear, Why should we care what it says in the Quran, especially if it's in Arabic? What we need to do now is to trust you that you are giving us the correct translation, and you're not. <laughs> this is the problem. And and also, you just said that. I, I don't understand you. You're saying he was illiterate, and then you're asking, well, how could he have written this? It doesn't make sense. You just said you can't write. So you, you, you're contradicting yourself. So this doesn't make sense, First does it? chapter, 33rd verse. He says, and he, it is he who created the night and the day, and the sun and the moon, each traveling in an orbit. How are you going to demonstrate this? <laughs> okay, the sun and the moon, and they are just swimming. And it doesn't say in an orbit. So what you are doing is you're mistranslating the Quran. The first scientific fact that it shows is that the, the movement of the sun and the moon and the earth, it makes the, the, the movement of the day and the night. A man named Muhammad could not have known that. And on top of that, to They're say not that the sun either. and the moon are both moving in an orbit, there is no way a man a thousand years before Galileo, without a telescope, without any research in front of him, could have known that. That's why it's wrong. As well. Okay. Another lucky guess, all right, let's keep going. In 1580, Sir Francis Drake, he circumnavigated the earth to demonstrate that it was oh, round Oh, I know flat. what's coming now. All around the I world know what's coming now. To show now. that it was round. Even today, some people think it's flat. But this is something, having the ability to go in a ship around the world was able to prove that. A thousand years before him, a man in a desert that never set mm. sail in the oceans, that had no ability to know any of this, he brought forward a Qur'an that was revealed by the Creator that told us that the earth is not only round, but like the egg of an ostrich, a spheroid. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, it's so predictable, isn't it? Um, no, 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 this is not in the Qur'an, this is nothing like that. This, this word, this ominous word is made so famous by Zakir Naik. This, this Tahaha, it just means that it, it was spread out. And what people went, this is Maurice Bouquet, who started this Bouquetism, who came. And by the way, people, you know, Muslims are saying, please don't do that. Don't use that. It's been debunked. It's been refuted. It's been ridiculed, in fact. So don't use it. But this guy, maybe in the States, they haven't, they're, they're not so clued up. And I don't know. So this Taha means it, it was just spread out. And because it, an ostrich species on um, a, a piece of sand and puts the egg in there, and because there is some sort of reverence, reference to an ostrich egg, then they say, well, it looks like an ostrich egg. Well, it doesn't. It's an oblate spheroid, and an ostrich egg does not look like an oblate spheroid. So this is to totally, totally ridiculous. Which is more accurate than to say the world is round. No, it's not. The, the funny thing is, Earth is actually quite spherical. Okay, it's only when you go into science and you go into scientific accuracy that you actually go and you say, well, it's a little bit squashed here, a little bit. There's a couple of miles off here, a couple of things. But if if you were to look at this in percentage points, it's like negligible. It's a sphere. Poles, it's squished like the egg of an ostrich. No, How could not. he have known that? But in the Quran, you will find it. And this was a thousand years before Sir Francis Drake by a man who never set sail into an ocean. Not just that. You may say, okay, these are a lot of these are intelligent guesses. Okay, the Big Bang Theory, which is accepted theory today in the Quran, no, chapter 21, verse 30. The light of the moon is, doesn't, doesn't come from itself, but it's reflected from the sun. How could a man named Muhammad have known that in a desert? Peace be upon him. He couldn't. But the Quran, it revealed it chapter 25 verse 61 no it that doesn't all of the, the sun and everything there will extinguish after a certain period of time the light of the sun will finish it, it, it will it will become a supernova and be destroyed this was no this was a spiritual thing showing that god's light will shine forever as all other stars will go and diminish at some what stage the scientists tell us today in the quran this was mentioned in and the funny thing is he's actually contradicting himself here because the Quran says and the moon giving light. 
So it's not talking about reflecting light, it's saying that it is a lamp on its own. And that Chapter is exactly what the people understood. The presence of intracellular matter, something that, that matter. there is no way a man in a desert couldn't read, have, would have known about in the Quran. Chapter 25, verse 59. The universe is expanding. How could a man named Muhammad have known that? In a desert. He couldn't have known that, and the Quran doesn't Desert. say so. No, no universities around him, no scientific research going on. He couldn't even, even if you put a book in front of him, he couldn't read. Now, the funny thing is, how would anybody know that it requires strength to construct a universe? How many universes has he seen being constructed so that he can estimate how much strength it actually needs? He hasn't, so he doesn't know, so he's just making it up. And this is what the people did who wrote the Quran. They said, well, it must be you know, it's huge, that must be like, like mighty power to construct a universe. The fact is, nobody knows. You know, it, it's, uh, it's quite uncanny how ridiculously, um, well, human the whole interpretation is if you put yourself into a mindset of a, you know, like a, like a, a desert nomad a thousand years ago, then it makes a lot of sense. I mean, that, that's why you have sentences in the Quran that say, well, um, you know, if a God wants to, he can um, kill you when you are naughty by the thunder clip. Yeah, but we know today that you can't. But the Quran still says it, that thunder can kill the human person. No, it's the lightning. But the Quran still says it's the thunder. So, you know, these are things that they really didn't know. They didn't understand. And this is what we find in the Quran. And this is exactly what they're doing here. Because you can see here, Quran, we are its expander. Okay, expander means it's a verb, but there's no verb in the sentence. So 5147 only says that this Allah has created with great might this universe, and it is expansive. So what Bouquet did, he didn't speak Arabic, so he just changed the expansive into expanding not knowing that he was changing it into a verb, which doesn't exist in the sentence. But people, you know, who are a little bit credulous, they, they look at this and they say, oh, look, he's, he's um, confirming what we believe, and this makes the Quran a miracle, so let's believe it. Let's take it and pretend like it is true. But it's not really. It's just pretending. Verse, in chapter 51, verse 47, it mentioned the expansion of the universe, something that we take as a scientific fact today. Uh, there's actually an embarrassing thing here because th this is based on, on what Edwin Hubble published in 1929. Okay, so they, ch they changed it then because if you look at the older translations, it doesn't have this. It's only after this that they suddenly started translating the Quran, this Musayun, Musayuna, La Musayuna, um, that they started to translate this into um, the expanding. Um, the funny thing is they they made it into constantly expanding because that is what uh, Edwin Hubble thought it is. And it's only 1996 when they found out, no, it's actually accelerating. Now they had to go through all the books again and take out the constantly <laughs> expanding because it was incorrect. And it shows how dangerous it is if you're going to base yourself um, or, your, or your book or your belief on anything that is scientific because scientific conclusions, not science, not, not anything, not the facts, not the, no, it, it just gets more accurate. It gets updated. So if, it, it's not that it changes, it just gets updated. And this is the danger if you latch onto this. This is these, if we look at geology, the origins of iron. Iron is an element we find, but as... It's not geology. It's chemistry. Geology would be mountains, and the description of mountains is totally long. I don't even know if he's going to go into this later on. Now, iron... Okay, the, the funny thing is he says it wasn't produced on, in the earth. Well, nothing was produced in the earth. Okay, maybe what gets produced in the earth is things like diamonds, okay? But, but that's it. You don't get elements being produced in the earth. Elements get produced in stars. And, and because those then uh, collapse into each other or in themselves, into themselves, and then um, expand outwards again, this is the stuff that you find floating around in space. And we still have this floating around. And then if the particles suddenly, come, you know, they, they clump together, and then you suddenly have minute pieces or centers of gravity. They attract each other. And this is how a planet builds. And if you have gas clouds, then this is how a sun builds. And we, we know exactly how this works. But And yet he says iron is sent down. Now, is sent down on the, I don't know, on the North Pole the same as down on the South Pole? Or is it the same in Canada as it is in Australia? 
No, it's not. So this is quite childish, you know, making claims like that with iron was sent down. You suddenly have little iron molecules floating down from the, from the stars or something. It's not how it works. But everything, everything on this planet are just pieces of stardust. They're just the, the, the pieces that are left over from exploding stars. So even all the particles in me, my, my body is made up of those, uh, of those particles. Everything is. The scientists tell us that iron is not made on Earth. Rather, it's made inside super red giants. The stars that are red super giants, that's where iron is made. And it comes from the sky and is brought down to the... It doesn't come from the sky. <laughs> my goodness. <laughs> I don't know. This, I, I, I wonder what goes on in a brain like this. What, what, he, what, what picture he has when he says this? Does he really think there are bits and pieces of iron coming down and then landing on Earth and we can go and pick them up? Doesn't he understand that the core is largely made out of iron? Doesn't, doesn't he understand that it took a hell of a lot of molecules of iron to come together and form this planet? Is, I don't know what kind of a, a imagination he has, how he thinks everything comes together. Earth with the meteorites and others hitting their planet. And that's where it came from. That's what scientists, they tell us today. The Quran, it told us this in chapter 57, verse 25. You see, and, and this is what it says, you know, there's iron where is in his great military might because they were using iron for their swords. That is the whole significance of iron. Because everything on this planet, whether it's oxygen or hydrogen, and then the, 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 the water, everything came from the outside, not just iron. And this is the funny thing is, this is the ignorance of the people who didn't know that things like carbon, or it doesn't matter whether you take heavier uh, uh, elements, which they all came from the outside. Physics. If we look at scientists, they recently discovered the Higgs boson particle, which is small. The Higgs boson is not that it wasn't directly discovered, all right? It was it was predicted to exist by Peter Higgs, and what what actually happened is the the Large Hadron Collider in in Geneva, they found evidence for the existence of the Higgs field and the Higgs boson. It's like looking up at the sky and you see a contrail and you know, aha, it must have been either a plane or a meteorite or something. This is how you, how you, you know, this is a logical um, deduction. This is not something that they saw, ah, here's this, this Higgs boson, here it is. And this is, this is the only thing that we see. It's just the, the density increases if there's a boson there. Otherwise, the Higgs field is not something that you can actually demonstrate. Smaller than an atom. Recently, we found that this is smaller than an atom. And before that... <laughs> No, oh my God. Okay, no, this goes too far. I, I don't know. I, I think he's, he's heard of, of particle physics and um, he's, he's heard of quarks and, and mesons and, and he's, he's lumping everything together. Well, it's smaller than an atom, so the boson must be smaller. There we go. That's not the way that it works. By looking at the atom and the nuclei and the protons, we saw something smaller than an atom. But a man named Muhammad in no, a desert could no, not have. No. He didn't have a telescope. He didn't have any of that ability. Dr. I think uh, he needs a microscope. He got the Nobel Prize for this discovery. <laughs> you can't but this. over 1400 <laughs> years before him, the Quran, it mentioned that that which is smaller than an atom, uh, propolation laboratory that they have in Pasadena, California. Propolation, yeah, the propolation. Paper. And this was recently published, <laughs> April 15, 2014, talking about the water world theory, the life's origins, it all came from the water. Talk oh, about goodness. The, this is ancient old. This is older than the Greeks, where, where people had this idea that everything is made from water, because as soon as you open it up, it's, you know, there's water. But this is nonsense, because you can't make anything out of water. The, the Quran says every living thing is made from water. Now, the problem is, if you try and make something from water, you can't. You always need to add something. Now, because cells um, contain a varying amount of, of water nowadays, nowadays we know this, um, apologists have, Muslim apologists have latched onto this and said, yeah, because look in the Quran, it says everything is made from water. Now, some say, well, the origin of life is in water, all of a sudden, um, accepting uh, the, the, the full evolution and saying, well, then uh, man must also have evolved from bacteria from the water. 
but they don't realize that they're doing <laughs> so <laughs> they're only taking this um, as as long as it lasts because if they want to make a point then they accept it if not well then they will reject it again electric energy naturally produced at the sea floor that that's what gave rise to life and the fact that 80 percent of crypto plasma which is what cells are what 80 percent of crypto plasma what is he talking about? Made off is all water. 80% 80 <laughs> 80 of the cryptoplasma, what the cell is made of, is water. What are you talking about? Number one is not 80% of a cell. Like you, the cells that make up your teeth are not 80% made out of water. Maybe your tongue, but there's varying degrees. I mean, this even changes within the human being. Like, like a, a kid has more water in the cells in total, if you measure the total amount of water, um, than, than an adult. But I don't understand what the hell you're talking about water. right now. Me and you were made 80% of water. No, we're 1400 not. 1400 years before NASA, without the JPL lab, without any of that research, the Quran, it told us, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَا كُلُّ شَيْءٍ حَيٍّ and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَفَلَا يُؤْمِنُونَ What did the Qur'an tell us? It tells us that in chapter number 41, verse number 11, that we made, Allah says, we made the, every living thing from water. I challenge anybody to, to show me something that they can make from water. There's nothing, you can't. You cannot make anything from water. So what he's doing is because you can't do that. He's changing it made from water into contains water. But the Quran, I remember, says you cannot change the words in the Quran. You're not allowed to. So what he's doing is he's doing something that the Quran explicitly prohibits, and that is changing words of the Quran. And then he puts the challenge, will you then not believe? <laughs> After looking at... This is always so cute <laughs> when they said, well, you can't do this. Well, you don't. Why, did, why don't you believe this? And, you know, <laughs> well, because it's wrong. Show me something that is correct that I'll believe it. If it's wrong, I will not believe it. Why should I believe something that is incorrect? Look at these, all of these scientific miracles. And we're going to give you a link in the description to the book, the, the Bible, the Quran and Science by Dr. Miris Burkai and other books. It's Maurice Burkai and this is... This is this is just one guy, I, you know, that you, you need sources, you need better sources than that, you know, than, than some guy who, who changes words from expansive into expanding. Come on, is that the best you have? Books that will show hundreds of scientific facts that are taken as fact that are mentioned in the Quran and not a single prediction in the Quran is wrong. The Quran doesn't have any predictions. They're just claims, and as soon as you check them, they turn out to be wrong. So there is nothing that you can show us. How could it be that this is except through divine source? A man in a desert could get one guess or two or three, but not every time. So I invite you to read the Quran yourself, to ask questions. In the, in the description, we have a link. You can send us questions. Don't spend your life without knowing the truth of where you came from and what your purpose is, as mentioned clearly in the Quran. <laughs> yes, read the Quran. It's going to make you into an atheist because there's nobody that will believe what it says in the Quran. We read the Quran on a weekly basis and we find so many things that are totally wrong every single week. Okay, guys, this has just been a quick uh, response or comment or whatever you want to call it, because I was fascinated by this, you know, how he rattles these things off and doesn't even realize himself that they're wrong. Okay, if anybody wants to correct me or something, you're welcome to do so. Until then, see you in the next video. Cheers. Bye-bye.